So today, Dr. Chris Brown, uh, I think as you all know, is one of Australia's best known veterinarians. You have seen him possibly as a co-host on The Project, uh, or perhaps um, you know, co-hosting on uh, The Living Room, or on the Celebrity Get Me Out of Here as well, as a recent show he was part of, which is good fun. Um, and I guess, you know, the Bondi vet, I think, is the one that we all know him mostly for. And today, he's going to be chatting about some work he's been doing across Australia as part of a Keep Australia Pet Friendly campaign. It's an important topic for us here at Google. Just last week, we had our own uh, Bring Your Dog to Work Day. Uh, we had sort of about you know, 40 or 50 dogs in the office, uh, which was good fun. Had a nice class photo, a bit of a selfie as well with one of the dogs, which was good fun. Um, but actually, what more people might not know is that in Google's Code of Conduct, uh, we actually list Google as a, a dog company. It actually says, uh, Google's affection for our canine friends is an integral facet of our corporate culture. We like cats, but we're a dog company. <laughs> so as a general rule, we feel cats visiting our offices would be fairly stressed out. So um, yes, unfortunately, no cats in the office just yet. Dogs we're working on. Uh, but Dr. Chris Brown's here to you know, share a bit of, the, of what he's been doing to try and make Australia a place where pets can roam free and be part of what we're doing, uh, the benefits of you know, why having pets is so great, and how the government and workplaces and all of us can help make Australia more pet friendly. There's uh, some Q&A at the end, so feel free to raise your hand. We'll bring a microphone around. Um, there's a dory as well, uh, which we'll submit some questions to. But without further ado, I'll play a quick video to introduce him. And then please welcome to the stage Dr. Chris Brown. Research suggests that our pets are good for both our physical and also our emotional health. So the news that our pet populations are declining is obviously a concern. The big surprise here is that despite our human population in Australia really increasing over the last few decades, our pets have done the opposite. Since 2001, our cat numbers have declined by 15.5%, whereas dog numbers peaked in 2009 and since then have also dropped. So I'm here in Bondi today to release the results of the Pet Positive Score, which is all about getting a snapshot into our pet society, seeing exactly how people perceive our pet ownership in the country and how friendly our cities are. So the score as to how pet friendly a city is, is it's worked out through a number of different ways. We've surveyed over 3,000 people to see their attitudes towards the city they live in. And we're really looking at how, I guess, inclusive the society they live in is actually towards pets. So how many pet friendly parks there are, pet friendly beaches, I guess how easy it is to, to own a pet in an apartment and also looking at the regulations around pets from the local council. Lulu is everything. Lulu is my life. She is the best thing to come home to because she's always happy to see us. I think everyone should have a dog. <laughs> so there's at least two to three decades or more of accumulated research and evidence to show us that pets provide a whole host of benefits, whether they're physical, social, mental or other types. For example, we know that physical activity is one way that pets contribute. Taking the dog for a walk each day is such a great way to get active. And when you're walking around, you meet people that you normally would walk past because we all stop and talk to each other. Of all ages, walks of life. At Mars, we're committed to making a better world for pets because we know they make our lives so much better. And that's why we're here launching this Pet Positive Score, which looks at the nine different attributes for cities um, that will help make them pet friendly. Things like access to outdoor exercise areas, pet friendly legislation, um, and accommodation availability. And we've done a lot of research, and that research has identified those attributes, but it's also ranked Australian cities in terms of their pet friendliness. There's some surprising news in here, and for a Sydney sider like me, there's also some rather confronting news, because Sydney hasn't done so well. It comes in at 15 out, out of 16. So Melbourne scored top at number one, then we have Canberra and also the Gold Coast. So overall, Sydney has a little bit of thinking to do.
So if there's one wish, it's that as Australians, we all work together to make sure we stay and hopefully become even more pet friendly. Well, thank you uh, very much for having me in here today. I, I should straight away apologise for, for missing out uh, last week. I, uh, like a good Labrador, I went down with an ear infection and, uh, and like a good vet decided to treat myself, which was mildly successful for about two or three days until uh, I realised that the bugs that affect people don't actually affect uh, animals and, and vice versa. So I had to go to a human doctor uh, reluctantly and, and be treated by, by him. He was very good, but uh, each time he sort of put anything near my ear, I compulsorily <laughs> just kick, kick my leg out wherever I could just to, just to let him know how it feels. But um, look, I'm here to talk about how we keep Australia pet friendly. And obviously in, the, in that video, there were some, some interesting statistics around where we're at at the moment and probably a, a few surprises. It's something I'm very passionate about and I'm passionate about it for, for quite a few reasons, as, as you're about to, to hear now. But before we go on, I want you to, to go back just a few hours uh, to when you first woke up this morning. And just think about when you first woke up, probably like, I believe, 60 or 70% of the population, you probably rolled over and, and checked your phone and had a look through social media. You, you saw what was making news. You saw whose birthday it was today. You sort of caught up on the world. And, and when you did that, probably while you did that, you probably scrolled past updates around pets' birthdays. And probably in the case of a few of you, scrolled past social media profiles for animals. Um, you know, some of them have a lot more followers than I do, uh, which I'm a little bit resentful of, and, uh, and a lot more followers than, than, you know, to be honest, a lot of people in Australia. So. I think there's a, a GIF POM. Do you guys know GIF POM? Very popular, little Pomeranian, looks like a teddy bear. 2.9 million Instagram followers. There's Tuna, Tuna the dog, who, you know, whose greatest talent, not that I'm bitter, is nothing apart from an overbite. Um, 1.9 million followers for that underbite. But it's, it's an interesting observation. And, and then I'm sure once you, you got up and you got out of bed and you, you headed off to work on your bus or on the train, you're probably bombarded with ads that, that featured dogs selling everything from toilet paper to, to laundry cleaner and laundry detergent. And you know, I, I, then you, you made your way into work here and you, you come into a, into a pet friendly workplace where you, uh, you, where you see dogs in the office and you hope those dogs are the hairiest and the smelliest members of the <laughs> workforce in Google, but you're not entirely sure. And over the course of those few hours, you're probably entitled to think that, that perhaps our world is dominated by pets and pets have a really important place. And there's a lot of love for pets out there in Australia. But as you're about to hear, dogs like Jif Pom, dogs like Tuna are about to learn a very important lesson that sometimes the number of Instagram followers you have doesn't relate to the number of friends you have in real life because unfortunately our policies as a nation uh, don't really show a lot of love and a lot of friendship towards our pets and, and there's a bit of a disconnect there because we seemingly love our animals but our policies and our governments and, and the way we, we legislate them doesn't show a lot of love in return. So I guess that's the, the whole crux of of what I'm keen to talk about today. Um, the, the whole idea of pet friendliness, it's something you hear about a lot. What we're referring to, it was touched on in, that, in the video, is we're talking about how inclusive is our world, how inclusive are our communities of, of animals. So if you have a pet, how easy is it to go down to the local dog park, take them off the leash, and let them run around in an enclosed space, burn off that extra energy? How, how easy is it if you own a dog or a cat to, to rent an apartment? How easy is it to, to take your dog or cat to the local cafe? Or if you don't have a car and you need to go to the vet, how easy is it to hop onto a bus or a train or get a taxi and go to the vet? And for a lot of those questions, the answer is not very. 
Um, and certainly in Australia, when you compare it to the rest of the world, especially when you look at North America and Europe, there are some quite stark differences. I don't know if, if many of you have travelled recently and been to, say, North America or, or to, <clears throat> to France, to Germany, to, to the UK. It's amazing how, how often you see pets in everyday life. Uh, I was in Italy three weeks ago and sat next to a pug on a plane. <laughs> and he snored, <laughs> but he didn't smell. And he was actually, he was, he was, to be honest, he was quieter than 99% of the other passengers on board. So it's only when you stop and you think and you go, hang on, why, why does that happen over there? Um, and, and why don't we have that here? That you start to think, well, what's, what's going on? And I guess the, the consequence of it being maybe not as easy to give pets the life that we want them to lead and that we think they deserve by being able to, to be included in our everyday life I don't know what that sound was, but I, I, I'll be cleaning it up later, I'm, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> the consequence of us not being able to, to give them the, the love and the, the, I guess, the life we, we think they deserve is, is the fact that, well, perhaps our po pet populations are decreasing for that reason. And, uh, and they're quite startling numbers, the fact that our cat numbers have decreased by 15% and our dog numbers are starting to fall as well. So for a nation that prides itself on, on being pet lovers, and we, we just easily refer to our pets as being our best mates, it's quite a, uh, quite a stunning discovery, I think, to, to actually hear that. So I think I'm very keen um, to, to look at why and try to reverse this trend now before it, it, it is too late to, to turn it around. So you probably you, you might be entitled to ask, you know, why, why is it such an issue if, if we're not pet friendly? Why is it such an issue if we don't have as many pets in our everyday lives as, as we have in the past? Well, I guess the, the way I look at it is that our pets are, are kind of like the, the furry friends with benefits. And, and they do make our lives better across so many different areas. And whether it's our, uh, our, just our happiness, they, they tend to have this unique ability to show us how we should approach life and how we should just let the worries of the world wash over us. You know, if, if you could live your, da your days like a dog does, with the exception of, of licking certain parts, it would be, be a happy day. You know, the, their attitude and their, their easygoing style is something I think we should all, all uh, take a leaf out of. Um, but, but also, our pets are continually proven to, to make us healthier. And this isn't just wishy-washy stuff that, you know, I feel better when I'm around a dog. It's actually hard scientific fact that pets have a positive influence on our health at all ages. So for kids uh, as young as one year of age, having a pet in the house results in a reduced risk of ear infections, reduced reliance on antibiotics, um, reduced level of asthma, and also a reduced level of colds as well. So. That, that's, a, that's an amazing um, statistic when you look at it. And it's backed up by a number of different studies. When you go on to adults, uh, our, our pets have a, a very dramatic effect on our cardiovascular health. So we're, we're generally fitter and we're healthier if we, if we own animals. They've actually been proven in some studies to, um, despite you know, not wearing active wear, they're actually the most <laughs> effective personal trainers out there. Uh, and, and I'll get to, to why that is in a second. But for the elderly, I, I personally think that the, the facts around the elderly are, are probably the, the most dramatic because the elderly, so people say over the age of, of 65, visit the doctor less. They make, make fewer hospital visits. They take less medication and they experience less loneliness if they have a pet. And, and when you consider our ageing population and you consider what our health budgets look like and you realise just how much money has to be put into supporting our, our elderly. You think, wow, like if for the, what the price of a, a bowl of dog food each day, you can actually have that positive health benefit. I, I just think it's, it's a, uh, to me, it's, it's an amazing trade-off to, to, be able to, uh, to be able to offer that. Um, th there's a lot of science around why those, those benefits e exist. Um, you can probably condense it down to, uh, to two things in terms of the health benefits, it's uh, it's 
really the constant exposure to non-threatening bugs. So if, if you're around a dog, you're getting bombarded with these non-threatening bugs that, that really struggle to infect you. So you, your immune system becomes hard and fast at, at recognising bacteria and viruses and going, ooh, dodging it, weaving it, working out how to deal with it and moving on. So constant exposure to non-threatening bugs. And in terms of the, the health benefits, um, it's constant exposure to non-threatening bugging from them wanting a walk. It's very hard to say no to, to a dog that is sitting in front of you begging to, to go for a walk. And as a result, we, um, we give in. But it, it's a, it's a, I guess it's a compromise that, that has really significant benefits for each of us. Um, one of the, one of the, the I, I'm exposed to, to hundreds of different studies every year. And, and the one that I love, it actually came out a couple of years ago. And it was from Kyoto University in Japan. Now, God, I love the Japanese. They, they can come up with some, some really interesting research. But this research centered around, they wanted to work out whether what we, how we love our pets, whether it's just us saying it, is it just something we talk about? Do we just love our pets because they're there and they're cute and they give us extra Instagram likes? Or is it something more tangible? And they actually put owners into a room and they monitored, they actually took samples from them, samples of saliva, and measured their hormonal levels. And what they found is when they, they brought their pets in and put their pets in front of them, they let them pat their pets, they released a hormone consistently, and that hormone is oxytocin. And oxytocin, if you know uh, what that is, is actually the hormone that we, uh, as humans, release when we see our loved ones and when we see our children. Um, so it's a chemical thing, it's real. The, the love for a pet is, is very real. The flip side of that, which I love, is the fact they, they then did the opposite and actually measured the levels in dogs and in pets. And guess what? It goes both ways. They actually released the hormone as well, <laughs> which is kind of reassuring in a way. They're, they're, they're not cheating on you. Um, <laughs> so. It's, uh, it's, it's a very special thing, but it's also a very tangible thing. And so you're getting a picture, I guess, of the fact that there are benefits across the, across the line in terms of the, the physical health benefits. But I think a really powerful benefit out there in the community, which, which is often undervalued, but is becoming more, um, more research and, and more recognised, is the benefit on mental health. And you'll see a lot of dogs out there that, that are in the role of being assistance dogs or, or therapy dogs. And the work they're doing currently with, uh, with kids with autism is, is quite remarkable. We're still not exactly clear why uh, pets uh, and animals, dogs, horses, all sorts of different animals have a positive effect on kids with autism. But the belief is that it changes the brainwave activity and, and, uh, and results in, in a more controlled brainwave activity. Uh, I, uh, I, I've had the pleasure of, of having a client at, at work who ha suffers from extreme schizophrenia. And he has been in therapy, he's been institutionalised, he's been on multiple medications over, over a number of years. But about seven years ago, he got two dogs, Oscar and Dudley. And he comes into the clinic about every three days and just loves it, he always turns up with these two dogs. And I had the, the pleasure of talking to one of his carers the other day, and, and I said, oh, I, to talk, talk to me about the, the dogs. And they said, hands down, the most positive effect on his life hasn't been medication, has not been our hospital system. It's been those two dogs. Because in his extreme schizophrenic state, where he has disordered thoughts, and he isn't really sure about what, what he's doing next, what those dogs do is provide him with a very clear path and a very clear plan for his day. And his day starts by getting them up and getting them outside, going to, going to the bathroom, feeding them. And the whole day is built around these dogs. And he goes out, takes them for a walk. And they say that, that without fail, that those dogs have, have saved his life, but also turned his life around. And this is just two dogs who seem to, like a lot of animals that I deal with and a lot of animals that I see in therapy situations, or even just in, in your everyday home, they seem to know what's required of them. And that, that's a really, I think, undervalued thing with, with, our, with our pets. Somehow they know. Somehow they, they seem to sense when you're happy. They seem to sense when you're sad. And they seem to know 
when is the right time to, uh, to put that little nose on your lap? Or when's the right time to just give you some space? When's the right time to, to try to turn your mood around? And I think that's a, that's a, really, um, that's a really, really special thing. So I, uh, I, I would hope that given the fact Australia, we, we, we do pride ourselves on being a world leader in, in a number of, of different areas. I, I would hope that, that we can somehow reverse this, this trend where we're not a world leader in pet friendliness. We gave you some of the scores there around the fact that, a, that Sydney was 15th out of 16 in the pet friendly scores. Well, Australia ranks right down quite low overall as, as a country. So it's something we, we do need to look at. And as I said, Europe and North America are kind of your gold standard. And, and they're not experiencing this, uh, this issue with pet population decline like we are. Uh, I was in Canada towards the end of last year, staying in a nice hotel for work. And as I was walking to the lift, a, a golden retriever walked into the lift with me, with its owner, and went up to its room. And, uh, and you know, I, I wasn't perturbed by that. I, I loved it. But this, this hotel was quite happy to have animal guests. Um, you know, cafe, anyone that's travelled to, to France will know that you go into cafes, it's, it's not out of the ordinary to sit up next to a poodle um, while, you, while you have your croissant. And, and I think far from detracting from the experience, it, it actually adds to it. It actually makes it, it more of a, a pleasant cultural uh, a moment to enjoy. So I guess we have to look at why, why is that? Why, why do those countries decide to, to focus on the positives rather than, I guess, fear the negatives? Like I think sometimes in Australia we, 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 can, um, we can do that. A classic example, I'm not sure if you followed in the news, the, the fact that a, a few months ago the, the newly formed Inner West Council in Sydney decided to ban dogs from the pubs. So after years and years and years of, of dogs being allowed to, to go into pubs around Balmain, all of a sudden the council decided no, on uh, occupational health and safety grounds, the dogs were no, now no longer allowed around food areas, so not allowed in any part of the, the pub. The, the absurdity of that is something that, that grabs me straight away. When, when you consider that on a, on a health, if, if health, if a health basis is what's being used there, pets have their bugs and, and we have ours. It's actually very hard for those two to cross over. So to, to think that there's a, a health risk around pets being in a restaurant or, or near where people are eating food, it's far more dangerous a person being near the food than it is a dog being near the food. I, uh, I'm hesitant to say this when, I, uh, when there's, there's a couple of cameras on, but it's, it would be far more safe for me to have a dog lick my face and lick my mouth <laughs> than a person I don't know. <laughs> I'm not going to give a demonstration right now, but that, that is a simple scientific fact. Um, and so, it's, it's, it's an interesting mental image, to, to be honest, but it, it does stack up um, time and time again on scientific studies. So um, pe people are very passionate about their pets. So I've been encouraged by, by the, um, the pushback on that idea of banning the, the pets in pubs in, in Balmain. But continually, I, I do find there are, there are little moments in our society where we have to check it and we have to sort of have a look at it and go, hang on, is that right? Banning the, banning the pets in the pubs is one, but we even had an example last month with the, the census, um, that highly success, successful <laughs> census. Um, so what we had there was, in the past, some census in, in some years have actually included questions about pets. How many pets do we have out there? Who, what pets do people own? This year, not a single question. So considering that, that pets are such a huge part of our communities, how can we possibly plan for communities involving pets if we don't even know how many pets there are out there and where they live? So as a result of that, I launched my own pet census that night, um, almost in, in defiance, and 100,000 people filled it out in the space of 48 hours, which, which is a remarkable um, contribution. Of people clearly recognising that, that that's not quite right. Um, but it also shows you how passionate people are and how willing people are to, to make sure their, their pets' voices uh, are heard. Um, and 
amongst all of the different data about how many different pets people owned and, and where they live and where they exercise their pets, there were some, some really interesting things which really show how much love there is for animals out there. 40% um, of people share their bed with their pet. Which, you know, I was just talking before about sharing saliva. That's, um, that's a lot of pillows being shared and a lot of wet patches that on the pillow that you can't quite explain and you just go back to sleep and think, well, hopefully it's my drill, not his. <laughs> so um, the, the other thing was how to, what's, the, what's the most affectionate way that people show their, their love for their, their pets? I asked the question, do people pat, do they hug, or do they kiss? Most popular was the kiss. Uh, I think it was 40%, uh, then 30% for the other two. So there is a lot of love out there. Um, and so hopefully, if government at a federal level, at a state level, and at a local level can, can recognise the fact that pets do make a huge contribution out there, they deserve to be recognised. And they deserve to be given their little slice. They deserve to be given, I guess, the pat in return for what they contribute to our society and to our health and to our well-being. And consistently, I find that the more we give them, the more they give us back in return. If people are worried about, about pets barking during the day when you're at work, well, funnily enough, access to an exercise area in the morning before you go to work may just be the best cure for that. So if we actually help them out and help them help us, then, uh, then often we're, we're better off. So I, I'm encouraged to, to come in here and, and see these, uh, these four-legged friends sharing the office with you. Obviously, Google's right on board. And, uh, and hopefully more and more people out there will recognise the importance of, of keeping Australia pet friendly. So thank you for your time and I look forward to talking with you after this about your own concerns. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was fantastic. I, I like the idea of having a pet census. Yeah. Um, because I know my girlfriend and I, we argue about whether or not the, the, the cat and the dog can go in the bed. And so I think the 40% is about representative. We sort of have an argue about that each, it, each it was, time. It was 40% on the bed. It was another 25% in the bedroom. Mm. So you can find like a compromise position where, <laughs> where they have their own bed next to the bed. But we all know how that ends. In the, <laughs> at, at about sort of midnight, there, there's a little sort of slow crawl up exactly. onto the, the corner. Exactly. And then they're like up by the pillow, you know, in a few seconds. Yeah. I know. And look, maybe I'm, maybe I'm sort of looking towards the future here, but I know plenty of people who uh, have been told, and I hate to put words into your mouth, um, that it, it's either you or the dog um, in, in the bed. So, you know, you, you can choose. That, that's just, that's just know, how it goes. I know. So I, I don't mind the cat sort of roaming, but the dog for me has to be towards the end. But look, you know, these are, these are, these are things. But... We, we did our own little survey here. Um, we had the Bring Your Dog to Work Day last week. Yes. And we sort of asked people at the end of it, you know, what did you find useful? How did it all go? And 50% of people said they found that public transport was a big challenge for them. So they actually found it hard to get their dog even to the office. So they wanted to bring them, but couldn't. Um, what do you, you know, for the conversations you're having with, with you know, government, that sort of thing, how are you finding they're re responding to that sort of challenge, like trains and buses and ferries and that sort of thing? Yeah, I, I guess the, the key message out of, out of any of this push to, to, I guess, open up the avenues for, for pets to be more included in society is that it does go both ways. People have to be responsible and they have to be good owners and they have to pick up after their pets and they have to, you know, if you have a, a dog that, that wants to jump up and, and hug and, and, you know, tongue pash every single person it, it meets, <laughs> maybe it's not, and it weighs 60 kilos, maybe it's not the perfect candidate to be going on public transport just yet. So you have to almost self-regulate a little bit. And, and we're very clear in that messaging. And, and this will only work if people are responsible as well. But, but we are making progress. And, and for the simple fact that I, I think government does recognize that there are some significant, significant benefits out there. And also, we, we have been, been caught behind, really, um, yeah. caught behind the rest of the world. And, and if we are looking for people to use more public transport, it's not our, uh, not people in the community, it's not their fault they don't have a car. We're, we're trying to encourage people to use public transport and, and not necessarily need cars. So that's got to include the whole family, and that includes pets. And also, look, there's votes in it. At yeah. a simple level, I, I do believe there's votes in it. I think people, 
you know, sixty-seven percent of people out there own own a pet. So generally, people aren't offended if we loosen up the the regulations around where, where pets can go. But but people are really thrilled if you do it for their animal. And you mentioned quite a few countries during your talk of where you've sort of seen this working really well. Mm. Um, you know, are there are there countries that that have a you know the best in class? You, you'd say like, is it, is it France? Is it France? Is, France is pretty good. Um, yeah, like North, Northern Europe is 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 quite good. Canada is actually very very impressive. I yeah. find. Yeah, that it's, it's across the board. It's it's in terms of um, legislation and it's in terms of uh, you know how how they influence their, their uh, registration practices with, with pets and microchipping and desexing and all the rest of it. But generally, um, Northern Europe and, and Northern North America are where it's at. The further north you go, the better it seems. <laughs> we had some fun questions as well that came through. Uh, so Australia has many unique animals locally, but a lot of them you can't have as pets. This, yeah. this, this uh, person listed a pet quoll, yeah. uh, a wombat, and a sugar glider, mm. and asked, um, how can we raise awareness of these beautiful animals, and how can we change the laws so that they can also be pets? Yeah. Where's the line drawn, basically? Yeah, I know. It, it's, it's a tricky one. That some of those animals that are mentioned there, the quoll is our native cat. Um, yeah, you, you want to be pretty selective about which quoll you take home. Um, <laughs> they, they, the, the thing we often forget about with, with dogs and cats, and especially the case in the case of dogs, is that they didn't just turn up. They, they have, we haven't just decided one day we want to ha keep a dog as a pet. We, we've been domesticating dogs for, for 10,000 years. So they're such great pets because we've made them that way. And uh, you, know, you wouldn't just grab a, a wolf and expect to raise a wolf puppy and, and think that the wolf puppy, it'd be yeah. awesome. Yeah. But <laughs> and think, think, a, a think, dingoes on my baby style. So yeah, well, that's yeah. the thing. Like, dingoes are an example of that. They, they don't generally, they don't, you know, as a rule, don't make great pets. Yeah. Because they're not domesticated, and uh, and so we've chosen those little attributes. We've we've generally chosen the the calm, responsible, you know, quieter ones that are affectionate. Um, so to do that, to have quolls or, or sugar gliders as pets, you, you can get lucky. You can get one that's very tame and very very quiet. But as a general rule, there's there's always going to be one in two or one in three at least that, that's not going to be suitable and might ruin it for everyone. It's such a shame though because sugar gliders are so cute. They but are, you know, at least, yeah. at least they're around and you, know, they're, you yeah. can go and visit them. They're and remarkably popular in the States as really? well. People yeah. actually have them as pets in the States. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think a controversial question someone asked was about cats. So obviously you know, I, I sort of preface this by saying we're a dog company. But someone did ask, um, cats while being one of Australia's most favourite uh, pets are hugely destructive to <laughs> native Australian animals. Mm -hmm. Um, and they sort of suggest, you know, how can we encourage people to either make sure their cats aren't sort of roaming all the time or be, you know, be more responsible around how they deal yeah, with cats? I, I actually think we, we give cats a, a hard time in this country. Um, yeah. We're one of the few developed nations. Um, we may be the only one or there may be one other country that's a developed nation where cat ownership is declining. Right. In every other country in the world, as we move into smaller areas, into apartments, everyone else has recognised that the the suitability of cats for that, and as a result, cat numbers have increased apart from in Australia, <laughs> and and I think it's the wildlife thing that, right. that, that causes that, which is a shame. And and certainly, cats are to blame for a huge number of, of wildlife fatalities. The when you look at the, the studies, though, the, the vast majority of those are feral cats. Um, your, your domestic home cat um, accounts for a small percentage of that. It's still too high, obviously, but that's why we're saying. It's part of being a responsible dog owner. Um, you, you know, you keep them in a fenced backyard with a cat. Keep them inside, or keep them in an enclosed cat area outside. Just, just if you do the responsible thing, then then cat, there's no reason why why cats can't be as popular as, as dogs in this country. And yeah. they um, they can be amazing amazing pets. I've got a cat myself who, who is was to be fair was raised with a dog and thinks she is a dog. And, so, <laughs> and and she's she's great, um, you know. The, and look, I mean, YouTube can't be wrong. Like, look at look at how many everyone look at how many yeah. look how many cat videos there are out there that are, that are popular. It's um, you know, I saw one last night on on like kittens massaging each other, and like that's adorable. Like, how, how can you not how can you not like that? Oh, I've got a I've, my my cat Cricket um, has an obsessive compulsive massaging disorder where if I leave her if I if I don't she actually doesn't sleep in my room, for, for one simple fact that at 
2 a.m., 3 a.m., 4 a.m., 5 a.m., she massages. Uh, gets into my room and just sits there. <laughs> she thinks she's giving a service, oh, but yeah. Like, you're never more relaxed than you are at 2 o'clock in the morning. Try, I do not need a massage at 2 o'clock in the morning. No, so. no fair, fair. Um, but on the point of you know, these social media stars, like uh, I had a quick look, um, Gifpom had a, a, a hoodie photo that had hundreds of thousands of, of likes. Yeah, and, and I looked at the overbite of, of Tune of the Dog. Yeah. How can we sort of use, if any of, if any of us have really cute pets or big Instagram followers, how can, we, how can we help try and push this forward, this sort of campaign? I've seen it's got there, hundreds of um, posts on the hashtag already on Instagram, that sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah. I think, um, how, well, how do you boost the popularity of your own pets online? Well, that too, but al also just to, you know, to, to get people talking about this idea of making Australia more pet friendly yeah. and, and that sort of thing. Look, I, I think when, when you, uh, there's, I think there's a, there's a real innocence around our animals and I think this is what they'd want. <laughs> you know, yeah. they, they really would and, and they're, they're clearly right, right behind it. And I just think that given all the love and all the benefits that, that they give us, I think it's only fair that we give them something in return. And then that's what the whole pet friendly campaign's about is just giving them something. Yeah. And uh, they actually don't ask for a lot. And if we actually give them, you know, give the dogs the, an off leash area, um, which are those enclosed areas, um, the amount of energy they burn off in, in a 20 minute run around there, they'll, they'll generally sleep for the rest of the day. So it's, it's, it's actually giving us something back in return in the way that they're more content, they're, they're less likely to be stressed when, when we're away at work. Yeah. So a lot of these measures, they're not just about making Australia more pet friendly, they're actually about our pets being more relaxed and, and, and better off as well. Okay. We'll have a question questions in the room too, so just raise your hand and we'll bring over a mic to you. Um, hi, I'm Marin, I'm French, and I've just moved to Australia last year. Um, I happen to live in a pet-friendly block. I don't have a pet, uh, but it's probably the only block in Kuji in about a kilometre radius that is pet-friendly. And the rule to have a pet in that block is the pet has to be less than half the height of your calf. So if you have like a pet that gets to your knee, you can't have the apartment. I'm quite tall, I could yeah, sit down there and <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you'd be fine. Um, but yeah, so my, my very good friend who had the Doberman obviously had to be, she couldn't get the apartment. So is that something as well that, um, like I, I didn't have a, only had a cat in France, so cats are no problem for pets in France. But um, is that something that you're looking as well to work with the governments to change the strata rules and the renting rules because it's pretty much impossible to have a pet? Yeah. Yeah. So the, the, the push at the moment has been to, the current rule is that it's up to the landlord to, to decide and I mean that, that's unfortunately almost the, um, your, that, that block is the exception to the rule. I mean generally a lot of apartments, is, apartment owners are saying no. But uh, what we're trying to push for is, is to actually switch it around so they actually have, the landlord has to give a reason why not as opposed to you having to, to push your case as to why. Um, and that's, that's an ongoing discussion and it's a hard one, but what, you, what you're saying with the, with the height being the, the issue, even that you know, is, is a little frustrating because uh, anyone that, that knows dogs knows that you know, a, a small dog, like say a Jack Russell, will have more energy than a big dog, like a Great Dane for example, and, and will be actually probably more inclined to bark and, and more inclined to, to be destructive in an apartment. So it doesn't make sense and, and that's, that's probably the frustration is that, that, that a lot of these rules aren't based on fact or aren't based on science or research. So, and, and it's the only way you can, you can change these things is by actually having face-to-face -face meetings and, and informing them and in a non-threatening way um, as to, as to what, why their, their policy probably needs a, a bit of a look. And the Jack Russell doesn't know that it's a small dog. It thinks it's a big dog. Well, it, you know. it, yeah, exactly. Yeah. exactly. Yeah. Uh, generally, you know, the, the, I, I know a lot of big dogs that, that would be happier in apartments than, than some small dogs, which, yeah. which is kind of counterintuitive, but it's, it's true. Thanks, Doctor. What are you, um, Thank you Joe. wanting um, <laughs> uh, pet lovers to do? Is it to lobby their member and, and get a bit more active? What are you actually wanting in terms of action from people? Yeah, uh, it's a good question. Thanks, Joe. Um, I, uh, I think it's, you know, we're, we're dealing with politicians, so it, it is making them realise that it's, the votes are involved here. It's, it's writing letters to the, the newspaper that the Telegraph has been right behind um, trying to stir up the, the issue with the, the pets in the pubs in, in the inner west. 
Um, they love opinion pieces because they realise that it's a passionate topic. And so, so get involved. Get, get on. Start lobbying yourself. Lobbying people yourself. Um, use the Keep Australia Pet Friendly hashtag on on your social media posts. Um, and and certainly keep keep all the feedback coming around what what is important to to you and your local area because um, we we in the fortunate position where we can collate that and actually um, make presentations to government. But if it's more than just us that that's in their ear, if it's actually um, members of their own electorates, then then it's a lot more powerful. Um, we met with the heads of local government a, a couple of months ago, so all the the mayors and, and local councils from around the country, and in the one month since that meeting, they've put in eight different eight new um, off leash area parks. They do listen, but their big their big feedback was they didn't understand why there was this buzz around off leash area parks. They didn't really understand why they were important. And it just, took, it just takes people to sit down with them and explain the benefits for them to go, oh, OK. Oh, so that's why they want the fences. So we couldn't work out why they wanted the fences. And, the, and the, we thought that that always looked strange to have a fence in there, but that, that's actually what you want. Oh, OK, all right. And, uh, and you know, a lot of those parks came about because people were lobbying their, their local government. They were starting up petitions. Um, you know, even just the, those change.orgs, um, those, those little online petitions, it's amazing the amount of support they get, and, uh, and if you can present, you know, a couple of hundred signatures to your local government, or to you know a couple of thousand signatures to, to a state government, you know, they start to listen. A local uh, council and park at a time, and then hopefully, you know, more join. Yeah. Hi, Chris. Thanks for coming in. Um, with regards to pets being allowed, or trying to get them to, you know, be allowed to come on transport, public transport, and things, I often see people taking their dogs and having to leave them, or their animals, uh, having to leave them outside of shopping centres. Mm. And um, what would be, you know, a way of, is there any way that you're going to be speaking to, like, the big shopping moogles and things like that? Because they're, they're on the other side of the government. It's really, again, like the, the units and apartments. It's a matter of the owner deciding. So is there any way of kind of communicating, you know, and addressing that issue with having to not leave your animal outside tied along a no parking sign or... Yeah, yeah. Look, it, it's a really good point. It, it's, we, we've tried to, in the campaign, I guess, keep... We, we don't want to go in with a wish list that, that is 15 items long. So we've tried to condense it to four, um, which, which is the uh, pet-friendly apartments, it's the dog-friendly parks, it's the cafes, restaurants, and it's the transport. But what, what you're saying is actually really important point as well. So, so certainly that, that's one that, that should be looked at. It probably comes down to, to zoning and comes down to, to regulate, like just an understanding of, of health regulations as well. And, and that, what I said during my talk about that, that fear around it's not, it's not healthy to have, um, have pets around and they spread disease, uh, even though, as, as I mentioned, it, it's the, the risk is extremely small. So yeah, it, it's part of the, the broader discussion as well, but I, I don't. I, it always makes me nervous when I see see that sort of thing because it also gives pets a bad name because they're tied up out the front, they're barking because they're left by themselves, and they're confused and anxious, um, and so it just you know almost reinforces the the opinion that, that those dogs shouldn't be in there in the first place because they're just making noise. Mm. But thank you. Do you have a favourite animal? Like I, I've seen on Instagram, you've got you know. Giraffes and dogs and yeah. quokkas. Yeah, I um, my favourite animal is uh, is it's a strange one. It's a cow. A cow? Yeah. Because <clears throat> they bring milk or? No, no. I, I, I was quite a nerdy kid, and uh, and we had a, a farm in the Hunter Valley, and I used to show cows at country shows, like in the white coat, the hat, and the little the little stick. And I always liked cows. I used to breed cows when I was a kid. And uh, and I, I love the I think what I love is the fact they're so big, um, yet so quite placid. Yeah. And uh, and yeah, it's, uh, you don't want to see the photos from that time. It was, it was really <laughs> what's what's the worst pet someone could get? Like the most problematic pet that's gonna you know the most visits to see a vet and, and that sort of thing. That's a question that, that always gets me into trouble. Because oh, right, no matter okay. the animal I say, there's always someone in the room. That He's got know. one. Yeah. <laughs> and you just see, you know, I can see it straight away and their, their facial expressions. It's like, oh, God. Um, but I'll, look, I'll play along and, uh, and, <laughs> and name and shame one. Um, no, like the, the, I, 
the one I, I guess I oh god why am I doing this the, I like all animals but the one I, I have the most sort of ongoing battles with is uh, the ferrets and ferrets. the thing is that when when you desex a ferret um, even though they're under anaesthetic subconsciously they let their scent glands go mm. and so everyone's seen the cartoons with skunks right and skunks let the scent glands go it's, it's kind of like that right I have to when I'm desexing a ferret um, How often do you desex ferrets? Oh, regularly. Um, <laughs> it's, it's not you, right? It's not yeah. often, but um, I have to like make an incision, run out of the room, have a breath, come back in, do another incision, out of the room, back in. Like it's like Fair. a workout. It's it's <laughs> quite it's quite amazing. But apart from that, they, they they can be quite affectionate. They've just got really sharp nails, and and if they're on the loose, they'll run up your trouser leg and, and just start scratching. So. I've heard our packers also are quite difficult. I like them though. You like them? A lot of attitude. They're very cute, aren't they? Yeah, I, I've seen someone. The whole spitting like thing, everyone <laughs> talks about like alpacas and llamas spitting. I always thought it was a, a bit of an urban myth until I saw a kid who was uh, who was rolling up a, an alpaca at a country show cop a spit in the face, and it was one of the most remarkable things I've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> Straight to YouTube. It was yeah. the entire like stomach contents of the the alpaca ended up basically on this guy's face. So. There you go. So everyone's going to go out and get an alpaca after this talk. Right. Other questions? Wow, three. We'll take part of the time. Maybe too much fun to take three at the same time. Uh, hi, Dr. Moran. Um, I'm an allergy sufferer, and I was wondering whether you have any suggestions on how allergy sufferers like myself and um, pets can more happily coexist. Yeah, good, really good question, and, and probably a, a topic where there's a lot of misinformation. So a lot of people think that, um, that when you are allergic to pets, you're allergic to the hair. And so the focus is always on non-shedding cats, non-shedding dogs. That's actually not true. So um, allergy sufferers aren't allergic to the hair. It's actually um, the dried uh, skin dander and also the saliva on, on, that sits on the, on the hair. So when pets groom themselves, that sits on the fur. And then once it dries, it flakes off, ends up in the air. We breathe it in. and, and give off the signs of being allergic. So um, having, a, having a dog that doesn't shed hair doesn't make too much of a difference, but coincidentally, for dogs that don't shed as much, don't produce as much of this protein. So um, the, the best way, if you're looking for a dog, is to go and spend some time in a room like, or, or outside, probably better off, with, with the puppies and have them all over you and see if you respond. And it's just a bit of a trial and error. Um, if you can find one that doesn't that doesn't cause you to be too allergic, then um, if you're ever having problems, wiping them down with a damp cloth removes that, that allergen off their coat and so makes you less likely to respond. In terms of cats, uh, Devon Rex and the Rex, the Rex breeds, the shorter, quite short-haired cats, produce less of that protein as well. Um, they're, they're working madly to produce an allergy-free cat using genetic engineering and they're, they're very close. Um, and so that, that, that may help as well. But um, the funny thing is that uh, often that you can actually manage allergies and ex by simple exposure to animals. Um, I'm actually allergic to rabbits. Uh, <laughs> so if I don't see a rabbit for six months or so in the vet clinic, when the next time I see a rabbit, I'll sneeze and have runny eyes. But if I see, say, four rabbits in a week, I'm not allergic to rabbits. You kind of you can almost self cure yourself by exposure. So it's um yeah it's one of those things. I'm not a human immunologist, so so you know it, it's you can desensitise yourself, but I don't know your exact form of, of allergy to, to know for sure. But they're the basic principles of, of, um, of allergies with with pets. They're, they're manageable. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Doctor. No worries. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, hello, Doctor. Thank you very much for being here. And my question is. What's uh, about the history? Has it always been like that in Australia, particularly in Sydney, the fact that it's such an unfriendly uh, city for, for dogs in particular? Has it always been like that? Or was it, was, what was the factor? Was there a, an event or a chain of events that triggered this sort of regulations against dogs, which don't seem to be based on any actual facts, as you mentioned? Yeah. It's, there's not a, an exact sort of moment where it all changed. Generally, through the 60s, 70s, and, and probably early early 80s, we were fairly relaxed, but we didn't have a lot of policy um, around 
where we sat ar ar around our regulations. But once we actually became more, I guess, litigious and, and also more, more keen to, to regulate, when we regulated, we went, I guess, probably above and beyond where a lot of those other nations have. Um, so we've never been one of the most pet-friendly nations in the world um, when it comes to regulations. And, uh, and certainly over the last 10 or 15 years, we haven't necessarily progressed and, and caught up with the, some of the deregulation that, that's happened in, in some of the other countries around the world. So we were always behind, but I think over the last 15 years or so, we've got further behind because we've actually regulated more heavily while a lot of other countries have become a little bit more relaxed. And what made Sydney sort of come 15 out of 16? There's certain things, obviously you mentioned the pub, yeah, but yeah. what other, other sort of things are you seeing that's different in Sydney compared to the rest of Australia? Yeah, it's, it's to do with uh, accessibility of, of rental properties is, is quite low. And, and I know just anecdotally through my friends, they, they really struggle to find um, rental properties. Lack of, of exercise areas is a huge one. So it's very hard to find a, a dog beach to take your, your dog yeah. in, in Sydney. Um, whereas in, in Melbourne, for example, that there's, there's quite a few that you can go to. But also, it comes down to, to policy and, uh, and looking to be positive with our policy. We, we tend to over-regulate, fine, um, we're, we're very strict with our registration, so it's almost like a, it's, there's a negative tone to our policy making, whereas in some of the other states, in meeting with, with the other states, Victoria, for example, is very positive when it comes to their um, puppy farming legislation. They're very positive when it comes to their, their um, registration policies for pets and, and reward you for doing the right thing. South Australia are looking at uh, a situation where you'll get discounted registration fees if you can show your dog's gone to training. So it's, and I think that's a much better way to be if you can actually give a little bit to actually get something back in return as opposed to do it this way or you're going to be fined, which I think is, has often been the case in, in New South Wales. And, I, and that's, that's probably where a lot of the, the, the fact that we, we drift down quite towards the bottom yeah. when it comes to pet friendliness comes from. Um, take one last question, or are we going to wrap up? I think we might have to wrap up. One last poll for the fun. Raise your hand if you have a dog. Raise your hand if you have a cat. Raise your hand if you have a different animal. What do you have? Rabbits? Turtles. Turtles. What type of turtle? An eastern long-necked turtle. There we go. Who else had one? Someone else? Fish. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> can someone say ferret just to really freak yeah. me out right now? <laughs> we, can, we can book in an appointment with you later, yeah, later right. this week. Yeah. Well, thank you very much all for coming. A big thank you for Dr. Brown. <laughs> so remember, tr try and get your, your favourite pets trending on Instagram. Use the hashtag and complain to your local council about why you haven't got parks. And we could all keep Australia pet friendly. Yeah. So. And there is a, a Keep Australia Pet Friendly Facebook page. Um, that where you can send in, in your feedback and, and areas you think need to be looked at, just keep Australia pet friendly. And also I have a Facebook page, Dr Chris Brown, that you can send in um, your, your feedback to as well. And, and we, do, we do listen and we do collate it all and we do present it, all the information to um, the relevant people. So it, it does make a difference. Fantastic. Thank you. Thanks so much. <laughs> Thanks so much.